Thank you, Emily. Well, good morning, church. I'm excited for us to continue our series looking at the Gospel of Luke, a series that we are titling No King. No king but Jesus. Praise God. And I'm so thankful for all of you who are worshiping with us this morning in English and in Spanish. So glad to, to have this beautiful community and have that extended time that we actually, I, I'm not sure if we planned for, but it was beautiful of being able just to, to talk and, and get to know each other because it's our, it's our middle name. Did you realize that? Park Community Church. Community is our middle name. We need to be about community. And today, we're actually going to be talking quite a bit about our middle name of what it is to be community. And to do that, we need to ask a question. A question that can sometimes cause some divisions in the community based on different views on how we should, how we should do this. And it's the question of, is it always wrong to judge, because our, our world says it is, right? Like, you should never judge, period. That's kind of how, how we've phrased it. Our culture has what we might say is a, a false allergy to judgment. We have the equivalent of a lactose intolerance to judgment. And if you have a friend who is lactose intolerant, you know what I mean. I say this is someone who has lactose intolerance. Let me just say that. But like, you know, it's like, oh, well, no, no, no. I can't, I can't have milk. I can't have dairy. But that ice cream looks really good. And so does the cheese. So I'll live dangerously. <laughs> Some of you are looking at your spouses now and like, yep. Uh, we, we do this. We, don't, we suspend our intolerance and bear through what will bring midnight regret and stomach pain because we think it's worth it. We're a culture that says don't judge, and then we judge everyone who we feel is being in any way the slightest bit judgy. You don't know me. Who do you think you are? Only God can judge me. We might even quote scripture, right, and say, judge not lest ye be judged. We use the KJV because it's stronger with the ye than the you, <laughs> right? It's like that'll teach them. But the problem is that if we take this verse out of context in this way, we condemn Jesus with his very own words. Did you realize that already in the Sermon on the Plain, that's the section of scripture that we're looking at right now, the Sermon on the Plain, different from the Sermon on the Mount, it's actually a completely different sermon, Jesus has already judged quite a few different people. He has told some people that they are sinners. He has told other people that they are ungrateful. And multiple times he has called certain people evil. Jesus judges. And so he's not telling us to just abolish these categories, but to use our critical faculties and judge without becoming judgmental. There's a difference. So what should it look like? How do we maintain allegiance to no king but Jesus and judge without being judgmental? I think in, in this passage that we're looking at today, Luke 6, we, we see three guidelines, three guidelines for how to judge without being judgmental, three guidelines on how to judge and keep our allegiance to Jesus. There, be generous, be careful, and be introspective. Be generous, be careful, and be introspective. Again, we're looking at Luke 6, so if you have a Bible, grab one. If you don't have one, uh, grab one. If you don't have one at home, you can just keep the one that's under your chair if you're on the floor or up in the balcony. We have bookcases. We have uh, ESV or Nueva Versión Internacional uh, for those who are speaking, uh, who are listening in Spanish. Uh, but I, I want to pray a little bit different today, if that's okay with you. I want you just to pick up your Bibles with me, would you? Pick up your Bibles. I'm on page 863 because, again, our world has so many opinions on this text, there's so many opinions on, on how we do this. I just want you to pray with me. So pick it up, and I want you to repeat after me. Holy God, we come to read your word. We have opinions. Our world has opinions. This book has truth. Fill us with this truth. Amen. I want to be filled with this truth. It's that simple. First, the truth that we are called to be generous, 
to be generous. Look at verse 37 with me there. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Let's stop, and let's just unpack that for a moment. We've already said that that Jesus has used some pretty judgy words in his sermon on the plain. So clearly he cannot mean that we should not make evaluative judgments. Some might say, I know, well, Jesus is God. He's allowed to judge. But later in this passage, Jesus actually tells us that we're supposed to be judging those who we follow as to whether or not they're, they're really worthy of of following. He says, are are they really worthy examples? Jesus is not saying to to close our eyes, put our arms around one another, and sing kumbaya with no regard for sin and correction. But he is saying that his followers' judgment must be generous. To say this in an extremely colloquial, colloquial way, Christians, we need to give each other the benefit of the doubt. We need to give each other the benefit of the doubt. This is not something that our world is good at. Where one poorly worded tweet will end your career and a video clip of you misspeaking will get you doxxed. Jesus is saying here that we must be generous before we judge. Christians, we have to be forgiving. I mean, Park Community Church, how wonderful would it be if someone were to, to just go up to you and be like, hey, uh, so, so, so what's your church like? What's Park Community Church like? How, how cool would it be if one of the first words that came to mind was forgiving? What if we were a forgiving church, a forgiven people who forgive? You see, unforgiveness is poisonous in so many ways. Physically, just ask any doctor. I'm not joking, like you can can look this up. It will cause physical health problems to be unforgiving. But it's also poisonous spiritually as it builds pride within us and causes us to belittle God's gift of forgiveness to us. Jesus' words here are are, are a proverb. That's That's the genre that it's starting with. He's saying, listen, Forgive and you will be forgiven. Judge and you will not be be judged. This is not about the uh, vertical relationship as much as it is about the horizontal relationship. Friends, we need to be, as followers of Jesus, people who build relationships of trust. Verse 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, will be measured back to you. Now, I know for some of us, we're like, well, what does that mean? That seems like a weird aside, Jesus. But but the picture that Jesus' first hearers would have imagined here was a picture of grain. To carry grain, people in that society would use the bottom of their tops, the bottom of their shirts, which typically had a belt hanging around it and kind of create a patch through which they could, they could carry grain. But the person pouring grain in Jesus's image is so determined to give that person as much as possible that they pour it in, press it down, and it's overflowing as they pour more in. They're making sure that there's, there's no space left without grain. Jesus is saying, friends, God loves to be generous. And so his children, who are the beneficiaries of his generosity, must act likewise. Because however much you give, friends, you cannot outgive God. You've had some difficulty with your sister, with your brother, your parent, or your friend. When Nate, Pastor Nate said, go around and shake someone's hand, you were like, well, not that person. Ooh, if you laugh, that might mean something. Are you someone who tends to believe the worst? Do you shoot first and ask questions later? Listen, as followers of Jesus, we need to remember that rather than shoot first, Jesus took our bullet. And so when you hop onto social media and see people piling on to someone for what they posted as followers of King Jesus, rather than joining the dog pile in the comment section, we send a DM with an offer for understanding and prayer. 
Rather than cutting cutting someone out, we start up a conversation. Rather than assuming intentions, we listen. Rather than name-calling, we empathize. Rather than holding a grudge, we forgive. Rather than seeking revenge, we seek resolution. Because God, through Jesus, did not cut us out, but started a conversation. He listened to us. The book of Hebrews says that he empathized with us in every way. He forgave us and reconciled us to himself so that we might be restored to right relationship with God. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He has been generous with us And so we are likewise to be generous with others. Be generous. And second, be careful. Be careful. Look at verse 39. He also, he also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Now, just to be clear, this parable is a hard one for me. In part, because I've actually seen blind people lead blind people. And to be honest, I have found that the blind are some of the best leaders I have actually ever seen. When I served as pastor for disability ministry at a church up the street that actually plants in our church called the Moody Church, uh, we had two blind men in our, in our church family who I would regularly watch lead one another through the church. One would hold the elbow of the other, and the leader would, would use his cane to guide him through the church and carefully explain every encounter and possible obstacle. Pillars, stairs, tables, groups of people. I can honestly say that I have rarely seen more beautiful leadership than the blind leading the blind. But Jesus' statement is not a pronouncement on the abilities of blind people. He's talking about when a person has no idea where they are going and they are obstinately leaning anyway. Jesus is talking about those who disregard all tools. They see nothing but claim to know the way anyway. They function by their gut. You know what I'm talking about? You have some of those people in your life who are like, I don't know, I just feel it. And sometimes they're right. But we, we need to, to be careful. Jesus is saying that there are plenty of teachings and teachers who make up in confidence what they lack in knowledge and ability. They look as though they're offering guidance, but will land you in a ditch. He builds on the statement with the point that students, that students can't advance beyond their teachers. Basically, he says, listen, you're going to become who you follow. Jesus is challenging his hearers to to break out of the molds that they are being offered and to come to the startling new way he is pioneering. He's saying, look at who you follow because you will become just like them. Be careful who you are being discipled by. You know, we, we sometimes take that word disciple and we make it like this really special, beautiful, magical, religious word. It's not. In the time of Jesus, philosophers had disciples, politicians had disciples. I mean, most any teacher had a disciple. A, a disciple literally means a student. But being a disciple is not the same as being a student in the modern sense of the word. As I imagine many of you, some of you know, uh, I actually function in part as an adjunct professor at Moody Bible Institute just down the street, and I teach a class of about 20 to 30 students each semester. And yet I'm sure that most of those students would not claim to be disciples of Professor Targe. In fact, I, I see some today, and they would be really upset if I, if I claimed that they were. They, they hear my lectures, they complete assignments that I give them, and I pray, I pray that they read a few of the papers and articles and books I ask them to. But it's very possible for you to be one of my students in my classes without ever really knowing me, without booking office hours, without ever stepping foot in, in my home and seeing firsthand how I interact with my family and navigate relationship difficulties. 
that would have been unheard of for a student, a disciple in the time of Jesus. A disciple actively imitated both the teaching and the life of their master. My students also don't call me master. I got to work on that. No, being, being a disciple, it was a deliberate apprenticeship which made the fully formed disciple a living copy of the master. And so when someone says they want to be discipled, biblically that means they want to be taught to follow and to mimic, to actually mimic. In J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Denethor II, maybe you know this, is the steward of Gondor, ruling in the absence of a king. And his son, Boromir, initially looks up to him and strives to fulfill his father's expectations, even to the point of seeking the one ring to aid Gondor in its defense. However, Denethor's despair and descent into madness ultimately leads Boromir to to question his father's judgment and seek a different path. Boromir's loyalty shifts from his father to Frodo, and the quest to destroy the ring. And in doing so, he begins to embody different values and principles than those of Denethor. You see, rather than mimicking and being discipled by Denethor, grasping for survival, he chooses to follow selfless hobbits, sacrificing himself in defense of the hobbits Merry and Pippin. Who you follow is who you will become. That's the wisdom Jesus is giving there. That's the the statement he's telling us. We need to check ourselves. Who is it that you follow? You'll either become like your demented dad or a humble hobbit. This is why, even though you said you would never become like your mom, once you're in your 30s, you're like, oh, no. The podcasts you listen to, the comedians you watch, the politicians that you celebrate, and the YouTube pundits you follow— Your news, your friends, your boss, and your favorite sitcom function as molds that will form you in one way or another. So church, be careful who you are becoming. Have you become more prayerful, more patient, more loving? Look at the physical and virtual company that you keep. Surround yourself with those those whom you can say, I will follow you as you follow Jesus. Have you noticed that you are becoming more judgmental, more anxious, less kind? Look at the physical and virtual company that you keep. If your friends and your news pundits, have you seen everyone who disagrees with you as the enemy? If they have you tirelessly talking about and posting your frustrations with those people, Take note, as followers of Christ, before you judge, before you post, we must be careful and ask the question, does this fit the mold of Jesus? The poet Grace Castle wrote over 100 years ago, before the the age of social media and before the ability to to judge at the speed of light without thinking, she wrote this, this beautiful poem. She said, if all that we say in a single day with never a word left out, were printed each night in clear black and white, it would make strange reading, no doubt. And then just suppose, ere our eyes should close, we must read the whole record through. Then wouldn't we sigh and wouldn't we try a great deal less talking to do? And I more than half think that many a kink would be smoother in life's tangled thread. If half that I say in a single day were to be left forever unsaid. Remember, Jesus was known as a, as a friend of, of sinners, a friend of critics, but when he did judge, he judged above all, and those who he sought to separate himself from were the religious elite. Now, he was not light on sin. Rather, he regularly called sinners to repentance, but he sat with them in love, allowed them to see him up close, He didn't tell them to to just listen to him from the place on the mountaintops. Are you going to judge? Be careful. 
Listen, you, you, you can preach from the mountaintops, but, but people learn in the valleys. Be careful what you say, how you say it, when you say it. Be generous, be careful, and be introspective. Be introspective. Look at verse 41 with me. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see that, the log is, that there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. What Jesus is saying here is that it is hypocritical to be hypercritical. Seeing the speck in someone's eye and ignoring the wooden block in your own. The picture that Jesus is painting here is actually quite comical, and I don't think that we, we fully grasp what it is that he's saying, so I just want to paint the picture for you. You see, Jesus is saying that it is ridiculous to, to function in this... I'm, I'm sorry, can you just hold on a second? Nate, you've got a snag in your sweater that's just, like, so distracting. Can you just, like, just get a... Get a it's, it's, you know, just, it's fine. It's fine. I'm going to move on. Uh, but, for friends, it is... Makes, oh, Chin Chin. Hey, Chin Chin, you've got something on your face. Can you, it's, it's a little higher. Nope, a little... Right, nope. Uh, you, you're missing it. Never mind. It's, you, you should work on that. Guys... It's this ridiculous. It's this ridiculous. This kind of critique is foolish because clearly I can't see if my seeing is impaired. It's for this reason that when, when they're giving instructions for, for travel on an airplane, that they say if the cabin, cabin pressure drops, you should put on your own mask before helping someone else. If you don't, you will become hypoxic. Due to low oxygen levels, you will become confused, restless, anxious, and unreasonable. If we don't deal with our own issues, we can't reasonably help others. If all we do is point out other people's problems from a perch, but never bend down to reveal and heal our own brokenness, we will make no difference. You can preach from the peaks, but people learn in the valleys. We need to put on our own oxygen mask first. We need to remove the log from our own eye. We need to see our areas of weakness and sin before we can claim to see clearly to point others toward removing their speck. And please note, Jesus is... Jesus is not talking about outsiders here. He's talking about his own disciples. Do you see that? Not the multitudes of fans, but the followers. This is not about how to judge the world. This is about how the community that Jesus is creating is supposed to judge one another, those who you shuck hands with this morning. I mean, this flies in the face of Cain's statement in Genesis 4 when he says, what, am I my brother's keeper? Jesus' response here is a clear, yes. Yes, you are. And he's perfectly in line with Torah teaching, which says in Leviticus 19, 17, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. Do, do, do you see what he's saying? To not reason with your neighbor, to not seek his correction according to the law of Moses, was to hate him. Thus, it was a violation of the next verse to, to love your neighbor. We cannot tolerate when our brothers are, are walking in sin. We have to take it upon ourselves. We are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. Hey, I, I want you to know truth, and I want you to walk in truth. So this passage is not an, an excuse to ignore the rebukes of others. We should never weaponize these verses, Christians. Don't, we should not be saying, don't you know the Bible? Judge not lest you be judged. Hey, take the plank out of your own eye. No. 
That's, that's not what these verses mean. As followers of Jesus, we must judge. We must ask the hard questions. We need to correct sin. We can't just say, live and let live. And so you should expect that if you are a part of the community here at Park Community Church, that you're going to be challenged, that you will be rebuked because you're our brothers, you're our sisters, you're our family, and we love you. Friends, but we, we have to be careful not to do this in just like a frivolous, uh, frivolous flippant, and unreflective way. G.K. Chesterton just said it so well once. He said, the mistake of critics is not that they criticize the world. It is that they never criticize themselves. They compare the alien with the ideal, but they do not at the same time compare themselves with the ideal. Rather, they identify themselves with the ideal. So be, before rebuking, we need to first be introspective. How do we do that? I have some questions that I think could be helpful for us as we, as we try and do this. Questions like, why do I need to be, why do they need to be, why do I think they need to be corrected? Do my thoughts on correction align with God's word? And do I actually hate this sin in myself more than I hate it in them? The first, why, why do I think they need to be corrected? You see, this, this means that we need to narrow our aim in correction not just acting like my children, saying, you're bothering me. That does nothing. Friends, if you are correcting someone, you need to be able to name the speck. If we can't do that, then we are being driven by our emotions rather than by care. And we cannot correct. Be careful not to be a haphazard judge who indiscriminately calls out every perceived flaw because no one can handle aimless critique. No one. Parents, teachers, employers, this is something that you need to, to really dip, just put deep in your heart. We especially need to remember this when we're seeking to, to correct those whom we're leading. John Ortberg, a, a, a former pastor in California, said it so well. He said, leadership is the art of disappointing people at a rate that they can stand. This is true of correction as well. Friends, we need to seek to, to lead toward Jesus. Don't judge without being able to name the speck. Second, do my thoughts on correction align with God's word? I mean, simply ask yourself, is this really their problem or is it mine? If a brother or sis, sister uh, in Christ is not walking faithfully, we need to call each other out. But sometimes... We just have preferences. There's a difference between calling someone to repent for dirty jokes and to repent of dad jokes. The former is not the way of Jesus. The latter is not your personal taste. Dad jokes are awesome, by the way. There's a difference between calling someone to repent of sexual immorality and to repent of public displays of affection. Now, there's a line with a second. But sometimes it's just cultural. Some cultures see men and women as holding hands as completely inappropriate, whereas others, it's completely appropriate still to greet one another with a holy kiss. So we need to ask, is this, is this biblical or is this personal or cultural? Is this wisdom or is this preference? If it's wisdom, we need to be honest with ourselves and those we are correcting in regards to how we see this aligned with God's word. Don't go over to name the speck unless you know where that speck appears in scripture or where you are influenced in scripture to name the speck. The Bible, for example, does not use the word race. Racism does not come up in scripture, race is a social construct that sinful humanity invented. Nevertheless, I hope and I pray that everyone here can say that racism is a sin. And it was through wisdom in alignment with God's word that the American civil rights leaders were led to call for correction. 
For example, Congressman John Lewis, who's now passed, he was an ordained Baptist minister and one of the 13 original freedom riders who rode an integrated bus from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans in protest of policies that southern states along the route uh, had imposed uh, segregated seating on the bus. He was beaten by an angry mob and arrested at the age of 21. And when reflecting on this experience, he said that the most important thing for him that influenced his decision to to go against this, to speak against this evil, was his Baptist faith. He said the civil rights movement was based on faith. Many of us who were participants in this movement saw our involvement as an extension of our faith. We saw ourselves doing the work of the Almighty. Segregation and racial discrimination were not in keeping with our faith, so we had to do something. He later goes on to quote the book of James, which which talks about partiality. Friends, does your correction align with God's word? We need to do this, and we need to ask this. And third question do do I hate this sin in myself more than I hate it in them? You know, Jonathan Edwards was a uh, revivalist preacher in the 1700s, and when he turned 23, he wrote out 70 resolutions for his life and ministry. Now hear me before, before we get into that. Jonathan Edwards was a deeply flawed man. If I were to encounter him today, I believe that he would need to be corrected. I believe I could name the speck, and I could point him directly to the texts in God's words that show why he is dead wrong on his views on slavery. But his eighth resolution nevertheless brings me to pause and reflect, not stopping me from correcting, but preparing my heart for when I do. His eighth resolution says this, resolved to act in all respects, both speaking and doing, as if nobody had been so vile as I, and as if I had committed the same sins or had the same infirmities or failings as others, and that I will at the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in myself and prove only an occasion of my confessing my own sins and misery to God." Do we, do we have that mindset when we, when we correct? Do we hate the sin in ourself more than what we see in that person? Church, look again at Jesus' words in verse 42. And notice, Jesus does not say, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye if you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? What did I get wrong there? If. if. It doesn't say if. If. He says, when, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. Friends, we must be introspective because we have a log in our own eyes. None of us is without sin. And so when we judge, we've got to be generous. We've got to be careful. And we've got to be introspective. Christians, we we judge as unrighteous people who have been judged righteous by a merciful God. If you're here today and you don't know this judge who has been generous, careful, and introspective with us, this Jesus who is without sin and yet still gave his life for sinners, taking on our guilt and judgment so that we might receive his righteousness and forgiveness, then please do not leave here today without talking to myself, Pastor Nate, one of our deacons or, or elders, maybe even the person sitting next to you who you were greeting before. You see, your understanding of of King Jesus and what it means to to have allegiance to him is our top priority. But if, if you do call yourself a follower of Christ and you are here harboring judgment and unforgiveness, if you've been trying to take the speck out of your, your sister's eye with a plank in your own, or if you've been in conflict and judgment with unforgiveness, we're about to do something that we call the Lord's Supper, communion, 
And I want to challenge you, if that's you, do not take. You would be preaching a false gospel of the unity of the church when we are not united. And according to 1 Corinthians, you actually might be eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Instead, I, I want to challenge you to do one of two things. First, either place the cup under your chair and abstain, or second, deal with it. Deal with it right now. As as the band comes up, and they're going to come up right now, I I want to invite you all to stand with me, and we're going to sing. And if you didn't get the Lord's Supper, our deacons and elders will be prepared to, to serve that to you. And if you are harboring unforgiveness, judgment, a lack of generosity towards someone, I want to encourage you, as we sing this this song before we take, just tap them on the shoulder. Just give them a little tap and walk out in the hall. Take a seat in the atrium on the couches. Go, Go someplace. Go to the car, husbands and wives, if you need to. Deal with it. Friends, we need to treat divisions in the body of Christ the way the Bible describes them. They are an emergency. If it's impossible to do it now, maybe you didn't see them today or you haven't been able to try to reconcile or you're, you're not even sure if it's possible. I want to encourage you again, just take a pass on the Lord's Supper today. We do this every two weeks. Deal with it in the next two weeks and and deal with it then. Take these next two weeks to be generous, to be careful, to be introspective, to take the plank out of your own eyes so that you can name and help remove the speck that is in your brother or sisters and be made right so that you can take of the Lord's Supper rightly.